Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? And if people join us here in a minute, we'll just uh, bring them up to speed. Uh, um, so thank you for joining. My name is David Boswell. I'm the Senior Director of Community Architecture here at Hyperledger. Before we get into Alexander's presentation, though, I did want to share just a couple of resources around decentralized identity. If you're really interested in this topic, there are other places where you can go into the community. Uh, um, I'm sure we'll cover some of those in the presentation, but I did want to point out just a couple of things. And here, let me share my screen. Just so you're aware, you know, this hopefully is the start of a conversation. We invite you to get involved in the community, you know, after the end of this meetup, you know, that's not the end of, you know, the opportunity to talk to other people in the community about decentralized identity. There are a couple other places that you may want to consider checking out. And again, Alexander will cover some other ones, but he, did want to point out a couple of things before we get started, just so you're aware. There is a regular meeting of the Identity Special Interest Group that is an open call where you can get involved. This is a really nice overview of everything going on in the space. It's an opportunity to meet other people doing, uh, doing things with the technology. So if you're interested in what Alexander shares today, please do consider joining the Identity Special Interest Group. And I dropped a link to that in the Zoom chat. And then if you're interested in some more of the technical details about what will be covered today, we do have a technical workshop coming up at the end of May um, that's going to be talking about using the Hyperledger non-creds project to issue verifiable credentials. That's an open workshop. If you're really interested in the, the nuts and bolts and the technical details of the some of this technology that we're going to cover today, feel free to take a look at that workshop. Um, so again, we hope that this is the beginning of a conversation that we will have with you on uh, um, the topic of decentralized identity. So thank you for joining. And with that, let me hand it over to Alexander Sherbakov. He is the principal software engineer uh, um, at DSA, DSR Corporation, uh, um, has a lot of experience with the technology, a lot of experience in Hyperledger around the different de uh, decentralized identity technologies such as Hyperledger Indy, Hyperledger Aries, et cetera. So I'm excited to hear uh, what he has to share with us today. And with that, Alexander, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, David, for the introduction. So let me share my screen. Okay, uh, can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you all for uh, coming today. Uh, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, what we're going to discuss today uh, is a topic of decentralized identity or self sovereign identity. Uh, it's about kind of summarizing the years of uh, development in this technology. Uh, and also one of the interesting uh, thing is how decentralized identity is related to the blockchain, because it's quite an uh, interesting relationship. Uh, before uh, we start, just a couple of words uh, about us. Uh, uh, I'm working uh, DSR Corporation. Uh, DSR, uh, its uh, main uh, headquarter is in Denver, uh, Colorado. And DSR has been uh, serving the companies uh, for more than 25 years, since uh, 1998. Uh, last year, DSR joined uh, the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, DSR has about 11 uh, technical departments like wireless embedded, uh, web, mobile, computer vision, artificial uh, intelligence. And uh, one of the important departments uh, department is uh, a blockchain and decentralized identity one. Uh, so uh, David already uh, introduced, uh, introduced me. So uh, I've been working with decentralized identity and blockchain technologies for more than seven years. And uh, during these years, I uh, had uh, an opportunity to work uh, and contribute to such important uh, Hyperledger projects as Hyperledger Indy, Ares, Ursa. Uh, and uh, my main goal today is to share my uh, experience and hopefully uh, describe what self sovereign or decentralized identity is, what are the key uh, technologies, what is the stack, uh, we also are going uh, to discuss some use cases and applications, frameworks, and as I mentioned before, what is the relationship between uh, SSI and the blockchain technologies. Okay, so uh, 
Again, uh, why uh, we are talking about uh, decentralized identity? I mean, DSR, uh, in DSR, we have uh, a department uh, devoted to decentralized identity and blockchain. And we've been working with these technologies for uh, more than seven years. Uh, we contributed a lot uh, in such uh, projects as Hyperledger India, Ares, Ursa, and uh, some other projects based on these technologies. Uh, also, as I mentioned, we are the members of Hyperledger Foundation. And, well, let's start uh, with the basics. What is a digital identity? So we all have an identity in a real world, like we have uh, uh, an IT document, we have ourselves, we have some uh, physical uh, stuff representing us. But nowadays, uh, more and more processes uh, go to internet, and we are now more online than offline. Moreover, we have the whole internet of things. So it's not only about identity of persons, it's about identity of things, devices. By identity, we can, uh, we can understand a set of attributes related to an entity uh, or to some agent representing this entity, which can be a person, organization, device, application. Uh, basically, we can consider three models of digital identity. The first uh, traditional centralized model uh, is when uh, we have a centralized uh, organization which manages our identity, the data associated with us. Uh, usually, the uh, most common way to authenticate and authorize is uh, use some logins and passwords. And of course, it's usually a mess because we have to remember so many passwords, so many logins. And uh, we don't have almost no control about our representation uh, of us within these organizations. Uh, so it's far from being perfect in terms of privacy, in terms of UX, and so on. A second model, uh, second model is uh, leveraging some identity providers. We can call it a federated identity. Uh, an example, when we have uh, uh, a provider uh, and we have a way to sign in with the same credentials to multiple places, uh, usually based on OAuth, OpenID Connect technologies. This is probably better from the X point of view for the end users, since uh, we may not need to remember so many passwords. But still, in terms of uh, the privacy and control of our data, it's uh, Still not perfect, still not perfect because uh, most of information about us is not controlled by us, it's stored somewhere on some uh, services. And uh, what is so unique about the third approach? We can call it decentralized identity or self-stored sovereign identity. Uh, the core thing here that it's decentralized, it's usually peer-to-peer -peer, and there is no uh, central entity uh, which has a control about our data. So two persons, two agents can communicate with each other uh, and they have a full control of how the data is stored, shared, organized. Uh, and in order to still have some trust in verification, usually distributed ledgers and blockchain technologies can be used as a source of trust. And the core difference here that uh, distributed ledgers, uh, they are uh, decentralized and it sounds like a nice way for uh, putting a trust there. But still, uh, the whole communication is much more, uh, much better in terms of privacy. Another picture uh, comparing the non-SSI uh, versus SSI uh, worlds. In, uh, Non SSI, usually we have multiple representations of us. So basically, on every service, uh, on every website, uh, we have a different representation which is stored on this website, right? So it's not good from UX, from privacy uh, points of view. In self serving identity, uh, we are at the center of communication. We control all the data, and it's up to us how we 
use and share this data. And what, also what is important that uh, the self sovereign identity is a decentralized identity way is much uh, better uh, compliant to uh, GDPR and other standards uh, which are currently present in European Union, US, such as California, and so on. Uh, as for how exactly uh, it works and what are the concepts between these just magic words, there are two main uh, definitions that uh, you should be familiar with. It's verifiable credentials and the centralized identifiers, or DID. Both of these standards, uh, they've been, they have been developing for a number of years, uh, but now uh, they are part of W3C uh, and they are now a recommended uh, standard. So I would say that uh, the maturity this year uh, increased quite significantly. And let's start with the first uh, concept. Uh, it's called verifiable uh, credentials. Well, first of all, let's uh, discuss what is credential itself. Uh, in this context, credential is a set of one or more claims uh, about an entity made by some issuer. For example, for a person, this claim can be like, uh, let's consider a passport, an ID like a name, uh, birth of date, uh, date, date birth, uh, address, uh, and so on. And uh, basically we have credentials like a physical documents in the real world. Uh, and you should have the same, but in uh, uh, internet, in uh, online world. Then the next concept is, is a verifiable credential. So basically, it's the same claim, it's the same credential, but uh, with some temper evident properties so that uh, the, uh, it, it can be verified that this credential is really true, it's really issued by a particular issuer, and we can trust this information shared by the owner. And the second uh, important concept here is uh, the centralized identifier, DID. Uh, the centralized uh, identifier can uh, refer to any subject like person, organization, thing. And uh, the main difference is that unlike some uh, common identifiers, the centralized identifiers are decoupled from centralized registries, identity providers, uh, and so on. Well, we'll discuss in more details uh, what exactly it means. But uh, in order to better understand how it will work together and what exactly is decentralized social identity, uh, let's look at the following uh, picture. Uh, it shows these concepts in action. Usually what is important in decentralized identity uh, is three actors. It's issuer, holder, and verifier. The holder, uh, it's a person, like some, uh, someone who actually owns the claims, the credentials. Issuer is an organization or a person who uh, issues these verifiable credentials. And uh, they're usually signed uh, by some keys. And usually uh, these keys are associated with some DID, it's called DID1 here. So that's where we can see how verifiable credentials and DIDs uh, work with each other. So the issuer has a DID, uh, the DID has some metadata and keys associated with this. And these keys are used to sign some verifiable credential. And then this verifiable credential is sent to the holder and holder can store it, can process it. And usually the holder may also have another DID, DID2 in this uh, example, and verifiable credential can be associated with this particular DID. And uh, the verifier, the verifier, it's uh, an entity who would like to uh, to know something about the holder, and the holder can present 
the information from the verifiable credential to this verifier. A verifier can uh, do necessary steps and uh, check that this information is correct. But it's important that uh, it's not necessarily the whole credential is shared. It can be a different presentation. Uh, we'll talk a bit further. For example, uh, some principles of selective disclosure can be used so that not uh, all the information is shared or uh, some predicates can be used in presentation. For example, the holder can prove that it's over 18 years old without disclosing the exact age. And in order to uh, make this all work, in order to verify uh, this presentation, there needs to be a place to store public keys and other metadata. And this place is called Verifiable Data Registry. In many cases, in many cases, blockchain or distributed ledgers uh, play the role of uh, verifiable data registries. What is important here that uh, there is no relation, there is no link between verifier and issuer. So, in the process of presentation, the verifier doesn't need to communicate with the issuer in order to check this information about the holder. So, it's kind of peer-to-peer -peer pairwise in these cases. Issuer talks with holder. It issues credential, then holder talks with the verifier, uh, presents the credential. And verifiable data registry as an independent source of trust is used for verification. Just another example, concrete example of these uh, principles. Uh, let's assume that uh, the issuer is a university, uh, the holder is a student, a future doctor, and the verifier is a hospital. Uh, where the student uh, like to be uh, an employee. So uh, the issuer can, uh, the university can issue like a certificate, a diploma to the holder, uh, and the holder can go to uh, the hospital and present a valid diploma or certificate that it's a real doctor and he can go there. No error between uh, issuer and verifier, Right, uh, because both of them just uh, issue put some public key to verifiable data registry, such as blockchain, and verifier can just read these keys from the uh, registry or from the ledger from the blockchain. In this case. Okay, uh, now let's um, uh, discuss a couple of use cases and applications. Uh, some popular applications, especially if you start. Uh, looking at some demos or pilots. Uh, for example, a very popular use case is to prove that you're over 18 years old if you need to go to the store and buy something. It's uh, one of the ways where predicates and selective disclosure can be useful. And for example, applying for a job, prove graduation, apply for a loan, you need to uh, prove unemployment. Uh, traveling, uh, you can also uh, show a valid uh, ticket or proof of valid visa. Uh, there's a number of uh, use cases which can be applied to multiple domain areas. For example, know your customer use case. It's when uh, these checks are done once and some credential is issued, and then the same credential can be reused with another verifier without a need to redo these uh, KIC checks again. Passwordless authentication, uh, it's uh, one of the ways uh, when you can just kind of scan QR code and use the verifiable credentials, DIDs, uh, for this process. And the provenance origin of data. It can appear in multiple use cases related to IoT manufacturing, whatever. Uh, verifiable credentials and these principles can be applied not only to persons, not only to human, but also to a thing. A device, for example, and for example, it can be uh, used to prove that uh, a particular part, uh, particular device is valid, not counterfeit, and can be trusted, can be used. One of the uh, important uh, places for adoption of these technologies is government based, government related uh, cases. Uh, for example, digital ID, digital passport. It's one of the things, uh, there's a number of pilots uh, in the world uh, where these principles are being used. 
Uh, for example, uh, in Canada, like PCGAF, one of the uh, good uh, references here where these technologies uh, have been running in production. Business regulation, certificates, that's another uh, thing where verifiable credentials can simplify the process of regulation and reduce bureaucracy. Proof of ownership, there can be a credential uh, proving that you own this property uh, and uh, again, it's good from the UX point of view, from no customer point of view. Travel and transport, uh, part of use cases. Uh, travel pass is especially a popular use case uh, where uh, the ticket can be actually a verifiable credential. And it's especially actual when there are some other checks which needs to be done uh, together with this travel pass. For example, during pandemic time, usually a vaccination certificate, a proof of vaccination uh, was needed, right? And it, uh, uh, using the self-certain identity concepts was a nice way to implement these principles. And uh, there were a number of uh, real applications which implemented it. So you have one credential like a COVID vaccination, and the second credential is a travel pass, and uh, it can easily be verified at the airport, the gate, and you can uh, board. Healthcare, uh, yeah, again, during the pandemic time, vaccination, it's an important thing, but it's not only about the vaccination. Uh, medical prescriptions, it's also quite important uh, information about the person that actually only the person should handle uh, should control. So it makes perfect sense to use uh, verifiable credentials for these kind of use cases. Medical records, again, that's something belonging to the user, to its uh, identity, and the user should be in full control of these records. Delivery of medicine, uh, it can also be uh, used. Uh, then uh, a set of use cases uh, related to banking, uh, know your customer procedures, loan applications, authentication, for example, like ATM authentications, business in HR, business cards, uh, entrance passes, proof that you're a real employee of some company. That's all a nice ways to use uh, verifiable credentials. Uh, merchant use cases, passwordless authentication when you go to the website and you can just scan a QR code and establish uh, a relationship with this. Uh, store. Uh, with this relationship, it's possible to do secure chatting. It's possible to integrate payments, and maybe to have some discounts, uh, proving that, for example, you are an employee of a particular company, and this company provides a discount for uh, their employees. And uh, IoT and manufacturing. Uh, I already mentioned the device uh, provenance, origin, uh, Delegation of access, uh, authentication, and authorization of devices, it's all also valid uh, cases here. Okay, so now let's uh, look at the SSI stack. Uh, so we're going more details how this will work. So we just uh, previously discussed two concepts, the centralized identifiers and verifiable credentials. Uh, but uh, let's see how uh, these uh, concepts uh, work in more detail. Details. Uh, a very nice representation of uh, this stack. Uh, we can use a trust over IP stack with four layers. Uh, on layer four, on layer four, we have the applications, ecosystems, domain areas like healthcare, supply chains, whatever, and, the, and real applications. On layer three, on layer three, we actually ha have these credential exchange uh, examples. This is where we have verifiable credentials. This is where we have issuer holder and verify, where issuer uh, creates issues, signs the verifiable credential, holder owns and presents it to verifier, and on this layer, also, there can be the exact uh, mechanisms and protocols, how to exchange uh, these uh, credentials, what are the steps in issuance, what are the steps in verification, what are the formats of messages, and so on. OK, uh, but uh, layer three here, 
these uh, messages, these protocols, these credentials, uh, they are transferred from issuer to holder and holder verify by some magic way. And actually layer two uh, answers the question, how exactly, what is this magic way for this communication? And as I mentioned, one of the core properties of uh, decentralized social identity is that it's usually peer-to-peer. -peer, and uh, some peer-to-peer -peer communication connection uh, is established between the entities, between the agents. So you can see in this picture, so usually between issuer and holder, and holder and verifier, they have to separate uh, pairwise connections. And all the protocols, all the messages, uh, they uh, are sent on top of this connection. And this is where actually the DITCOM, DITCOM uh, happens, since uh, uh, we have two DIDs, for example, for issuer and for holder, can be pairwise DIDs or some other DID methods. Uh, and uh, authenticated encryption uh, principles are used uh, to make sure that the data uh, through this connection is encrypted, is authorized, and is uh, properly secured. And on layer one, on layer one, we have public utilities, public utilities. As I mentioned before, uh, in order to be able to uh, do verification uh, of signatures and proofs, uh, we need to have access to public keys shared by the issuers, for example. And uh, that's where we uh, may have these uh, blockchains, ledgers, uh, which may contain this uh, information, like public keys, uh, DID documents, DID metadata, and so on. Okay. And now let's uh, look at every layer in uh, more detail. So verifiable credentials. Uh, so we already discussed the main concept. And this is a picture, like the most famous uh, picture from the W3C standard describing uh, the uh, workflow of uh, verifiable credentials. We have these three entities again, like issuer holder verifier, uh, issuer issues credential, holder tours credentials and can present, send a presentation to the verifier. And we have verifiable data registry as a source of trust, which can maintain the schemas of the credentials and can maintain the identifiers and associated metadata like public. Uh, in this WFTC schema, uh, there is an error from folder that it can register identifiers that use schemas. Uh, actually, especially in the indie and areas world, uh, usually a pairwise or peer identifiers uh, are used. So uh, the holder is not necessarily need to write some data, for example, to the ledger, to the blockchain, right? But uh, for issuers, uh, it's quite common that they uh, use a verifiable data registry, such as ledger or blockchain, uh, to uh, put some uh, DIDs and keys there. So as for the verifiable credential types, uh, so we have Hyperledger Indy, we have WRTC verifiable credential, we have a number of various protocols. And uh, basically, basically, we can consider four types of verifiable credentials. Sometimes they're called credential flavors. Uh, three of them are based on W3C standard. This is uh, JSON-LD with LD signatures, like more or less common standard signatures. JSON-LD with BBS plus signatures, which support zero knowledge. Uh, and uh, uh, GVT, JSON plus GBS, which is also part of the standard. And uh, the fourth type, the fourth flavor of verifiable credentials is uh, CL anoncrats, or in zero knowledge and predicates. Uh, historically, uh, CL anoncrats, uh, the first implementation uh, was part of Hyperledger Indy, which is uh, one of the main Hyperledger projects. Uh, and uh, these two standards were uh, developing in parallel. Uh, there are goals to converge them eventually. But basically, even now, I believe uh, these four types that kind of established and every type has uh, the own content pros and depending on the use case, depending on the 
uh, exact uh, needs and requirements, uh, one of these ways can be chosen. Uh, before we uh, compare them in more details, uh, let's just uh, discuss the concept of selective disclosure and predicates, right? So we have, let's assume we have a credential. Uh, we have some claims like ID of the holder, his name, address, date of birth, some other metadata. And uh, we need to present something to verify. What selective disclosure means that uh, we are not forced to present and disclose all the data. For example, we can disclose only the nickname and that can be enough for the verifier. So the goal here is to, to disclose only the minimally, minimal required information which uh, is needed to verify for this particular use case. Moreover, predicates, uh, we can prove not just some data, which is some value, which is in the claim itself. We can prove some predicates, for example, that the age is greater than 20 years, like in this example, right? And it's even more better in terms of the privacy, in terms of uh, security and sharing really the minimally, minimal, uh, minimally sufficient information. So this is the principles quite important, selective disclosure and predicates. Now let's look at this comparison table. So we have these four flavors uh, that we discussed, JSON-LD, LD proofs, JSON-LD, BBS plus, uh, DUT, and still unencrypt. As I mentioned before, the first uh, three are based on W3C recommended standard. CL unencrypt, uh, it's also mentioned there, but basically uh, there is now a separate unencrypt standard. And uh, but as David mentioned, uh, there will be an upcoming uh, webinar event uh, devoted to this new initiative. But historically, Syrian and Kratz, it's not new. Uh, as I mentioned, the first implementation uh, was done in Hyperledger India, later it became part of Hyperledger Ursa. Uh, so it's quite mature standard with mature implementations and been used in many use cases. So, selective disclosure and predicates are two concepts that we just discussed. Uh, as you can see, selective disclosure is available for BBS Plus and for Steel Anocrat. It's not available for common GUT or for JSON LDLD proofs. In these, for the, uh, these two types, you have to disclose all the information, which can be a problem for some use cases, but can be perfectly fine for other use cases. The predicates. Uh, the only type of uh, credentials that support it is uh, CL Anocrat. So for other types, it's not available this right now. Again, uh, if the use case requires a need for a predicate, then, well, CL Anocrat is a good option. If it's not needed, which can be also true for some use cases, then yeah, other credentials may also work fine. Serialization, uh, JSON-LD is used for the first and second flavors, and just a common JSON is used uh, for DVT and still on credits. Uh, crypto signature, for JSON-LD, it's, well, basically we can consider it like a more common digital signatures. Uh, it's an elliptic curve, uh, cryptography, or like RSA. Uh, and uh, for BBS Plus, it's uh, well, quite a new standard, but very promising, uh, which uh, allows to use selective disclosure and zero knowledge proofs. GV, uh, GBS, it's also quite common standard uh, for WT and for Jose, uh family of standards. And for CL Anocrats, the crypto here, it's uh, quite unique. Uh, it's based on zero knowledge proofs and uh, uh, its implementation uh, now is available in uh, Hyperledger Ursa as part of Hyperledger Ursa and it's leveraged by many other frameworks. Uh, let's uh, consider four more uh, columns, criteria here. Credential schema. Credential schema. So we discussed previously that credential is some set of attributes like name, whatever, but what exact set of attributes? Because it's pretty important in the use cases to understand uh, 
what are what is the set of the attributes what are possible values what are restrictions it's important for interoperability uh it's important uh, for the verifier to understand what to expect what data to expect it's, it's important to the holder also to know uh what format of credential will be and uh for json uh json ld uh we can say that uh json ld context by itself it provides some means some set of attributes uh the credential schema plus optionally a json schema uh can be used as well in addition to this for uh gwt as it's json based uh json schema can be used here and for cl anonymous but basically yeah for these types it's kind of the part of uh serialization i would say but for uh, cl anonymous uh it's a bit different uh, since there a dedicated uh, object, a schema object, uh, needs to be created. And the schema object defines a set of attributes for the claims, for the credentials. Usually, usually this schema is put uh, on the ledger, becomes public. For example, it can be put to Hyperledger in the ledger. The next uh, important uh, criteria is uh, how issuer shares the public key right because uh as i mentioned uh in general any credential any claim needs to be signed it can be more or less common standard cryptography or it can be a more advanced zero knowledge proof based cryptography but the main uh, principle of uh a need for a private and public key is usually for all four types of credentials and uh is any uh, asymmetric uh, for use cases, uh, there needs to be a way to share this public key. Uh, and in uh, uh, standard uh, WFC credentials, uh, usually it's assumed that the public key is the one associated with the DID. Uh, so DID, it's not just identifier, it also has some metadata, uh, like the document, uh, which uh, may contain the public key, which may contain the public keys. And uh, in many cases, usually these uh, deed and deed doc are put on the ledger to make it public so that any verifier can uh, resolve it, can resolve it uh, from the ledgers and uh, do the necessary verification of signatures. For CL and credits, uh, it's also a bit different. Uh, there is a dedicated object which is called credential definition, which contains a public key for the issuer, uh, which is used by the issuer to sign their credentials. Usually, usually in addition to credential definition, the issuer should also have a DID and DID doc, uh, which both of these things usually put on the ledger. For example, in upper ledger India. A third important criteria is, uh, OK, we have uh, a credential, but it's pretty important to link this particular credential to this particular holder right so that issuer needs to make sure that it's really issued to this holder and later on only this particular holder for whom it's issued can present it uh and uh in case of w3c credentials the first three flare uh, flavors uh usually uh, the holder creates a dad the corresponding keys uh can be either pairwise or it can be put on some public ledger and uh the holder can uh prove the ownership of these keys by some signature uh against this did in the presentation so for example when the holder presents uh presents a claim to the verifier there needs to be two signatures the first signature from the issuer and the second signature is from the holder proving that the holder really owns the key associated with this verifiable credential. OK, and for uh, CL anonymous, uh, again, it's a bit different. Uh, there, the, con the, so -called, the concept of so-called linked secrets is uh, used. used. Uh, and this uh, secret, uh, it's just one key, uh, which is used during the issuance process and it links uh, every particular credentials to this particular holder so only the person who knows the link secret can create a proof can create a presentation uh, for the verifier and also it's important that it can create combine multiple credentials from 
even different issuers. Uh, it can all link them all to a particular holder so that uh, multiple uh, credentials from different issuers can be used in the same presentation, in the same proof. And uh, the last criteria, it's uh, revocation. It's revocation. In many use cases, the credential itself, uh, it should not be issued like forever. There should be a way to revoke it. For example, a driver license is a good example that in case of some uh, issues, it can be revoked. Uh, by the way, in some credentials, revocation can be achieved just by having the corresponding fields in the credential itself, like a timestamp. So for example, after this timestamp, the credential is not valid anymore. But in many cases, uh, a real more advanced revocation, uh, which is uh, initiated by the issuer of the credential, needs to be present. And uh, for uh, the first uh, three types of credentials, uh, usually the uh, status list uh, standard is used for orientation or for revocation. It's non anonymized, basically. Uh, basically, it's kind of a list of indices of uh, credentials that's uh, revoked, and the verifier can check it and make sure that credential is not uh, revoked. For CL and CRATs, uh, the anonymous approach is used. It's based also on quite advanced cryptography, zero knowledge proofs, and accumulators. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, well has some cons and pros. For example, it uh, supports anonymous revocation, as I mentioned, but it's quite heavy, uh, quite heavy process. For example, it requires uh, the holders to store quite significant amount of data on their side in order to be able to prepare these anonymized uh, proofs of non-revocation. Okay, and uh, the next important uh, point on this layer is uh, uh, exchange protocol for uh, verifiable credentials. Because okay, there is credential, there is some cryptography. We know how it's kind of signed, uh, but properties are there. But how exactly the issuer uh, can give this credential to the holder? How exactly the holder can give this credential presentation to verify? Uh, this is very important uh, for interpretability to define the standard so that uh, the holder can work with multiple issuers, with multiple verifiers, uh, multiple implementations from multiple vendors. Uh, so interoperability is uh, pretty important here. And Hyperledger RS is the first, uh, the first set of uh, protocols. Uh, one of the main goals of creation of Hyperledger RS was actually uh, the goal of standardization and uh, creation of interoperable protocols, which can be implemented, can be, mu can be multiple implementations. There's a set of areas RFCs, uh, which define these protocols and concepts. And there is a number of implementations of these RFCs. Uh, here we can distinguish uh, areas interoperability profile uh, version one uh, and version two. So there is a set of uh, tests uh, which can prove the interoperability between various implementations and frameworks. And this includes like uh, issuance protocol, presentation protocols, protocols for establishing connections, out of band, protocols for mediators, and so on. There's quite a lot of them. But with what is important that as soon as protocols are implemented correctly as a test pass, uh, different implementations can work together in interoperable way. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, family of uh, protocols uh, as part of uh, Australia's Identity Foundation, in particular, DITCOM V2, uh, has been developing there. And there is a presentation exchange uh, protocol and the corresponding issuance with three protocols and so on, uh, which is basically kind of advancing. Uh, what is in areas is more details. And uh, the third, the third uh, way here is uh, OpenID. Uh, OpenID Connect for uh, refiable credentials. Uh, these principles uh, has also been developed for quite a long time. And 
now they're becoming more uh, mature. The main idea, idea here is uh, uh, to let the users, uh, the business who got used to OpenID or OAuth, uh, to uh, easily, smoothly integrate uh, the centralized identity, self certain identity into existing use cases, basically leveraging the same technology. Right, because uh, their their uh, verifiable credentials uh, can be issued as part of uh, uh, as part of usual uh, OpenID OAuth workflows, uh, and uh, verifiable presentations uh, can also be shared under the same principles. Okay, so now let's move to. Uh, layer two of uh, our trust of RP stack. So we discussed the credentials, we discussed uh, multiple ways how credentials can be exchanged. And uh, uh, now the channel, how exactly it can be exchanged. Uh, on this layer, we have like agents and we have pairwise connections and did call. So basically uh, on this layer, uh, we establish in a secure private communication channel which is built on top of DADs uh, and uh, usually did call. Uh, this picture it shows uh, what exactly this pairwise connection mean. For example, we have Alice and Bob. As we here we assume peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And uh, Alice and Bob create a new pair of DADs for this uh, exact communication. So for, for example, if Alice would like to communicate with Carol, uh, it will be a different set of DIDs and keys. So usually it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Of course, it can be uh, extended to have like uh, uh, three parties participating in the same channel, but in most of the cases, it's usually uh, just two. And once these peers uh, are exchanged, Alice knows the DID and the key which should be used to send messages to Bob, and Bob knows the DIDs and keys to be used to send uh, messages to Alice. Uh, and they can establish a secure connection and start exchanging some messages uh, during this channel, during this channel. So basically they're doing authenticated encryption. So it's encrypted only by Bob, only for Bob by Alice, right? And Bob can check it. And as for what kind of messages are there, it can be any messages for any protocols, basically any protocols. Well, in this uh, case, it's just some um, game, but uh, in our use cases uh, by protocols, it can be the protocols for issuance and verification of credentials. For example, if Alice is an issuer and Bob is a holder, then Alice can send messages for the issuance uh, protocol, like. Uh, proposing a credential, uh, Bob can confirm accepting this credential, then the Alice can send the credential itself, and so on. There is some state machine, basically, uh, which is defined as part of this protocol. And uh, finally, layer one. So we are talking about DIDs quite a lot. And now let's look in more details uh, what exactly it is. As I mentioned, it's part of the WSVC. Uh, standard. And uh, basically, uh, usually DID consists of uh, two main parts. It's DID method and method-specific string like unique identifier. Uh, this DID method, DID method uh, usually defines uh, how exactly uh, the DID uh, should be resolved and handled, what are the set of rules, uh, what kind of verifiable data registries can be used, and so on. What is important here that DID it's not just identifier like UUID, it's also a set of metadata. Uh, we call it DID document, which can contain, for example, service endpoints, uh, which can contain uh, some keys for different purposes. Uh, and this is the names, this is uh, the examples of these purposes. For example, uh, we can define the keys to be used for. Uh, secure connection for uh, key agreement, uh, key exchange. We can define the keys used for authentication. We can define the keys to be used for 
assertion. Uh, we can define the service, some endpoints. So this is quite important. The doc is a set of metadata associated with the DAD, which is put on some uh, verifiable data registry. Uh, and it can be used to establish pairwise connection, to uh, sign the verifiable credentials, and so on. Uh, so just to summarize again, uh, where exactly the IDs appear in our use cases? For the issuer, for the issuer, usually issuer has a DID and corresponding D document containing the public key. Uh, and the corresponding signing key, private key is used to sign the verifiable credentials. Indeed, did doc public key, usually they are public and put on some ledger. For the holder, for the holder, uh, the holder's DID can be used as part of uh, verifiable credentials so that this verifiable credentials is associated with this holder's, uh, with this holder's entity. And the proof of ownership of this DID uh, can be uh, created by signing using the corresponding private key of this DID of some nouns. So it usually is done during the presentation. During the presentation, holder can prove to the verifier that the, prover, uh, that the holder really owns the DID mentioned in the verifiable credential subject. Right, so credential is issued for a particular holder's DID. And during presentation, holder can prove that he uh, really owns this DID. This DID can be public in some use cases, so it can be put on the blockchain. In some cases, it's OK, it's sufficient uh, to use just a private DID, like pairwise, peer, key DID. So there is no need to uh, put it on the ledger. And uh, DID methods, uh, just a couple of examples, actually the full list not the full list, but uh, it is most of uh, DID methods uh, that can be found here in this uh, specification. And there are more than uh, 100 different methods. Uh, for example, uh, DID solve, uh, DID Indy, they, uh, they uh, describe how the IDs can be created on top of Hyperledger in discovery networks. DID checked or checked network, it's also a ledger for uh, identity use cases. Uh, did key, did peer uh, in, did, in these uh, entities. Uh, usually, the did doc, this keys, metadata, it's kind of encoded into the DID identifier string itself. So, for did key, basically, there is no need to uh, have a dedicated uh, place to store did doc because once you have a did key, you can decode it and you get the whole did doc, you can uh, get the whole uh, public key. Uh, did peer is basically the same, but did peer also uh, has uh, some strategy for uh, updating this information, like for key rotation, changes in making changes in did doc and corresponding metadata. And uh, basically, there are the ID methods for maybe most of uh, well known ledgers, distributed ledgers, uh, blockchain, uh, to root uh, the corresponding did docs and metadata on these uh, ledgers and blockchains. OK, uh, so SSI and blockchain. Again, just to uh, make it clear uh, how these concepts are related to each other. So what is the more important? Blockchain is basically optional in many SSI cases. You can see that in this trust or IP technology stack, blockchain appears only on layer one, only on layer one on public utilities. Uh, it's can be one of the implementations, one of the ways uh, for uh, verifiable data registry. What is usually stored on the blockchain? What is usually stored on the blockchain? For example, in case of Hyperledger Indy, Hyperledger Areas, uh, issuers, public keys, issuers, DID, DID doc. It's usually put on the blockchain. Then uh, credential schemas, as we, uh, as we have seen, uh, there, for example, in the case of CL Uncreds Hyperledger Indy credentials, there is a need for a dedicated uh, object which can define the schema of the credential. And uh, it's usually put on the ledger. And revocation registries. It's also quite 
common to use a ledger as a source of trust for uh, revocation. For example, in Hyperledger, there is a number of transactions uh, for these purposes. But may be stored on the blockchain optionally. Holders, did, did dog, public keys, they can be stored on the blockchain, but it's not mandatory in many cases. Just a pairwise uh, DID is enough. And finally, what is never, never stored on the blockchain? It's, of course, private keys, link secrets, and verifiable credentials. Verifiable credentials. The verifiable credential is never stored on the blockchain. It's stored usually in the user's wallet, like Edge wallet, mobile phone, or maybe some cloud wallets, properly encrypted. But it's never stored on the blockchain. Since verifiable credential, the whole uh, concept of self sovereign identity, the centralized identity, that it should be owned by the holder only. So it's stored only in the place where holder has access to it. It should not be public. It should not be public. Public here is only like public keys, credential schemas, some information which can safely be shared. And uh, well, the last uh, section that we are going to uh, look at today is uh, uh, frameworks, uh, the main frameworks in SSI world. Let's start with the SSI ledgers, because as we have seen, uh, although basically the ledger, need of the ledger is optional, but in most of the cases, uh, we do need a ledger as a source of trust to share in the public information. And one of the most popular ledgers is Hyperledger Indy, and uh, for example, the Sorin network, which is based on Hyperledger Indy. There's a number of other uh, networks, uh, deployments of Hyperledger Indy, uh, not only Sorin, like uh, this service, Sigaf, and so on, uh, but they all use the same uh, code from uh, Indy. Uh, the second, the second uh, well-known ledger is uh, checked. Uh, Indy, it's public permissioned ledger, but checked, it's a, a public permissionless ledger based on proof of stake uh, with some crypto tokens involved. It's based on Cosmos SDK. Uh, and basically, checked supports, for example, CL Anoncrats, supports WFC credentials. So all the main use cases and credential flavors uh, are supported by this ledger. Uh, then the next uh, examples are uh, like layer two ledgers, for example, ION. Uh, it's side tree protocol on top of Bitcoin. There are also versions on top of uh, Ethereum network. Uh, this is uh, one of the concepts uh, there that in many cases in SSI, uh, we don't need like a full ordering of everything, but it's sufficient just to have the order within the domain of a particular DID, particular user, right? The order of how the uh, keys, for example, are rotated there. And yeah, this uh, can be used to uh, create quite efficient uh, solutions. Uh, which I just need to anchor to layer one blockchain like Bitcoin from time to time, but don't need to have a global ordering of all the events there. And uh, as for SSI frameworks itself, which uh, implement all the building blocks for uh, decentralized identity. So it's not only the ledger, it's also the corresponding cryptography, API, wallets, uh, protocols, and so on. Hyperledger Indy was historically uh, one of the first uh, implementation. It was it became part of Hyperledger in 2017, and uh, later on uh, in 2019, Hyperledger Areas uh, appeared. And last year, uh, a new grant initiative, Anoncrats, was also uh, established. Hyperledger Indy, uh, it's a graduated project. Uh, what is important, it consists of two main parts. This is a ledger and the client SDK. Uh, Indy implements all three layers of the trust over IP models that we've just seen. The ledger, uh, the uh, credentials, the corresponding protocols. Uh, the Indy SDK is written in Rust. And there, are, there is a number of wrappers uh, for many popular languages, including mobile. Uh, 
the main and the only type of credentials that India supports its uh, CL autocrats. Sorry, it was historically the first uh, deployment of uh, India Ledger. And, uh, well, um, India SDK, it's quite monolithic library that contains uh, uh, the code for communication with the ledger, uh, code for verifiable credentials, the wallet, and so on. And uh, now a new generation of uh, SDK of SDKs uh, have been created. For example, India VDR, it's just focused on communication with the India ledger. RSSCAR, it's a new uh, wallet, which is being adapted by many areas framework. India Shared RS, it's, uh, or Anacrest RS, it's uh, uh, also some implementation related only to CL Anacrest credential, independent of the ledger, independent of the protocol, and so on. So it's kind of the trend here to break this monoliths, and uh, many Happy Ledger Areas projects already uh, adopted these new libraries. Then Hyperledger Areas. Uh, it's, as I mentioned, uh, uh, is a graduated project as well, and it uh, was created in 2019. What is the core thing in Areas? It's actually the specifications, the RFCs, the set of interoperable protocols, concepts. And there is a number of uh, implementations of these specifications in uh, various programming languages. For example, ECAPI, Ares Cloud Python, Ares Framework Go, Ares Framework JavaScript, .NET, Ares VCX, it's a Rust implementation. Uh, also, we have uh, frameworks for creation of mobile applications, mobile wallets, such as uh, Ares Bifold, Ares Mobile Legend React Native, uh, Ares Mobile Legend Xamarin. And uh, in order to make sure that the frameworks are interoperable, important part of Ares is Ares Agent Test Harness. Many implementations are based on Hyperledger Indy under the hood and use Indy Ledger as a primary one. But now uh, there is ongoing effort and trend uh, to be ledger agnostic and to use the new uh, ledger independent uh, CL Anoncrats implementation and specification. So we can see that this kind of picture from monolithic Indy to uh, areas and to Anoncrats, being uh, developed, being adapted right now. And I believe the community has a pretty good progress here. And Adam Kratz, uh, it's a ledger agnostic specification, uh, incubating hyperledger project created last year. Uh, Ancrats RS, it's a Rust implementation with wrappers for popular efforts. And there is some going effort to migrate uh, areas, many areas implementation to this new sale Adam Kratz. Uh, instead of India. Okay, uh, that's all that I have for today. Thank you. Uh, digital identity. Decentralized digital identity. Decentralized identity. Okay, thank you, Alexander, for your presentation. I'm sorry, Elvis, are you uh, asking something about decentralized digital identity? Okay, please put your question in the chat so we can uh, understand you more uh, more clearly. Okay, my name is Anton Virimyanin, and I'm a PR specialist at DSR, and now I uh, suggest we will move to our QA session. Uh, well, first question about from Jimmy Dorsey. What is new with Anon Kratz? Well, David basically shared some shared the link about it, but maybe Alexander, you can something to add. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Anon Kratz historically uh, was part of Hyperledger Indy, and uh, the corresponding cryptography is implemented in Hyperledger Ursa, which is shared uh, library. Uh, Cryptographic library hyperledger, and uh, historically uh, this implementation was uh, uh, coupled with the uh, Indie Ledger and Indie project, uh, which is good on one hand since it provides a full set of SDK and tools for creation of uh, the centralized identity SSI based applications. So all necessary tools are there, 
But uh, on the other hand, of course, in terms of uh, better interoperability, better adaption, it's good to support uh, different ledgers. It's good to support uh, different uh, methods. Uh, and one of the goals for this initiative is to make it ledger agnostic. Another goal, uh, as you've seen, uh, there are kind of two generations of verifiable credentials. The CL Uncreds 1, uh, which was originated as part of Hyperledger in the areas, and W3C credentials. And uh, of course, it would be great to converge them eventually so that they are better interoperable with, with each other and uh, uh, can work together. So this is also a goal and uh, to make sure that it's uh, better uh, addresses the current needs, standards, and converges this. Uh, as uh, for the implementation, yeah, it's uh, supposed to be more granular comparing to what is in Indy, so that it can be used as is uh, independent of other parts of the ecosystem. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Uh, one more question from Benjamin this time. Uh, how can an issue verify that a physician's diploma submitted online is not counterfeit? In other words, how can the did issue verify if you're submitting a forged certificate? For example, a passport with a photo faked in Photoshop on the first submission. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, what is also important in um, these four layers, this stack, is uh, some kind of the governance procedure and the ways uh, how to establish this trust. So in particular, for example, let's assume we have an issuer, right? And uh, the issuer can put uh, its DID to be used for uh, issuance to a ledger. And uh, it's assumed that it needs to be a procedure and trust to know that this particular DID belongs to this uh, particular uh, issuer and uh, can be trusted. Uh, there are some standards, uh, for example, well-known DID, uh, which helps to associate, for example, a domain with a particular DID. So for example, uh, there can be uh, a GVT object, assuming that uh, this domain, like example.com, uh, associated with this particular DID, which can be used to issue refinable credentials. OK, thank you, Alexander. And I can see that Brett uh, raised his hand. Maybe we will have a live question right now. Brett, you can unmute yourself here. Thanks. Thank you. This question may go toward David Boswell about the handbook. Is there a way to get the hyper the indie handbook? Um. Mm. Uh, you're talking about indie documentation, or we yeah, use the yeah, handbook? Yeah. I've, yeah. Well, yeah, okay. That's that's what Daniela Barbosa said. Is a, is a uh, handbook. Yeah. Let me get a couple links. Thanks. Here, there's an in, there's a wiki for indie, just like all the Hyperledger projects have a wiki page with links to different relevant resources. That may be what you're looking for. Uh, um, if not, just Brett ping me in Zoom chat and I'm happy to share some other links as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, thank you, David, and thank you, Brett, for your question. Uh, one, more, one more question from Suresh. Uh, would it be possible to access the slides after the session, please? After the session, please? Yep, sure, we'll share the slides. Uh, Jim Dorsey, where are the public keys stored in the Aries mobile wallet? Where would I find them? Okay. Uh, so, uh, if I think they're talking about the holder part, is since uh, usually the mobile wallet is used by the holder, like in this issue holder verifier thing. And uh, uh, it depends on the type of the verifiable credentials, but let's assume uh, we use. Uh, CL uncreds in the types of credentials. Uh, and uh, there, uh, basically, uh, edit peer methods are used to establish their connection, right? So the corresponding public keys doesn't need to be stored somewhere on the blockchain. They're just stored uh, locally, kind of in the wallet and exchanged during the 
connection establishing process, right? So uh, for the holder, for CLN credits, there is no need to store anything on the blockchain. Everything can be stored locally in the wallet, including the private key, secrets, and the corresponding uh, public keys are also just exchanged and stored there. Uh, thanks, Alexander. One more, one more question uh, right now uh, from Suresh. Uh, why is Hyperledger coming Sorry, up? Uh, uh, Jimmy, sorry. Maybe. Yeah, sure. Should Jimmy go ahead? Well, yeah. I was wondering where the... Oh, sorry. sorry, is that two computers going? <laughs> so I'm just wondering, since I'm running a uh, an instance, of, of a Vaughn network, which is a, a chain to um, store the keys. Just wondering where can I find those keys as an issuer? Okay, you're talking about the issuer, issuer side. Okay, for the issuer, for the issuer, sure. the keys are uh, stored on the ledger, on the ledger. If you're talking about the Vaughn network, probably about sale item credits and Hyperledger Indie, then there is a dedicated transaction, which is called credential definition, cred def, and it contains the public key of the issuer, which is used to sign the credentials. Okay. There is another transaction in uh, uh, Hyperledger Indie. It's called NIM, uh, which can be used to store the uh, keys associated with the DID, keys associated with the DID, which is needed in order to send um, credential definition, actually. So usually the process is the following for the issuer. Issuer, first of all, uh, creates a schema. Sorry, first of all, uh, creates a DID and the corresponding public keys, put it on the ledger, on India ledger. Then uh, these keys, uh, this DID can be used to create a schema for credentials. Also put it on the ledger. And then uh, the keys needed to issue credentials should be generated. And the public key can also be put on the ledger using the DID. So you should be able to look up the public key given you have a DID and access to the ledger. Yes, yes, all formation is public. Uh, there is a number of, uh, well, of course it depends on what kind of network you use, but it's a public network. Usually there are some browsers like Indiscan, which can be used to look up uh, the transactions and you should uh, look for- yeah, uh, yeah, we're on the bond network, so. So given the DID, we should be able to look it up on the Vaughn network. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your question. And I believe you have a question, live questions from Amina. Amina, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello, and thank you for your presentation. So I asked the question in the chat, but I will repeat it. Uh, is uh, I have a Mern stack project and I want to implement the uh, Akapai um, instance and I don't know how to run it uh, how to run it uh, locally on my machine. So if you have an idea or recommend a tutorial to follow, mm -hmm. well, uh, I believe uh, you could just look at the Akapai repository. It contains a number of pretty good uh, tutorials uh, how to do it. Also, Akapai is one of the uh, it's one of the key areas projects. Uh, uh, it's part of the basic uh, SSI identity tutorial provided by Hyperledger. So if you go through these steps, like I think it's called how to become a SSI developer, something like this. Uh, yes, I, and... I followed this. Uh, I followed it's a, it's, a, it's a course uh, on Linux Foundation. Uh, mm -hmm. I followed it, but but it doesn't have like uh, step by step or like clear information on how to run it locally on your machine. So I've been running it uh, since yesterday, and I followed mm -hmm. the official documentation on Hyperledger and GitHub. But I actually always find problems, so I don't know what to do. Yeah, my recommendation would be, of course, to look at the repository because uh, I know that there are some Docker uh, images that uh, basically you can just run, right? So usually there is no need to just uh, build everything by yourself. Uh, also, there is a, like a PyP version. This is written in Python that you can also run. 
So uh, look at the repository, and also there is a, a channel in Discord uh, for Ekapi. You can, I think you can reach the community, Ekapi community, and ask questions there if you face any issues or that on clear points. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question, Amina. Uh, one more question. Uh, Suresh is interested, why is Hyperledger coming up with separate credential type instead of leveraging W3C option? Yeah, uh, actually Hyperledger didn't uh, come up with a separate type. Historically, historically, CL Anoncrats was implemented before, before W3C standard uh, was mature enough. So it's a kind of was in parallel process, historical process. Uh, and uh, the Alan Kratz, as I mentioned, uh, it's the part of Hyperledger Indie since 2017. But W3C uh, became a recommended standard only like in 2021. 20, uh, so uh, 20, 22 actually. So uh, there was two separate uh, processes coming in parallel. Uh, but yeah, as for any technology, usually it's not that straightforward. There is a number of branches, and uh, like in any tree, there can be multiple branches which can live, live together, and it can be perfectly fine. And also, as I mentioned, there are some cons and pros in Erasis approaches. Theron Kratz is uh, probably the only choice if you would like to have predicates, uh, but uh, in some cases, uh, more simple cases, Maybe usage of WCC credentials is also fine. And by the way, many areas protocols uh, support both types now. They both uh, they support both WCC and uh, CLN credits. Okay, thanks. Uh, is having predicate the only advantage of hyperledger credential type? Uh, no, it's not the only advantage. Uh, Predicate is one, also revocation. Uh, it's a bit more secure in terms of privacy. It's, it's anonymous. Uh, then selective disclosure. Uh, before BBS plus uh, signatures were created, it was quite significant difference between a common JSON-LD or DVT-based credentials and CLN creds. Now with BBS plus, of course, yeah, it's uh that not a difference anymore but well if you need both selective disclosure and predicates and serial and crest can be a very nice uh option so basically it's uh predicates and uh revocation uh, thanks alexander uh one more question from benjamin compared to using polygon id as a service basis how many advantages does our hyperledger indie have Mm. Uh, well, I'm not the expert in Polygon ID, to be honest. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that actually Polygon ID provides all the principles of uh, the centralized identity. Maybe I'm wrong. But in any case, uh, the advantages for using Hyperledger areas, Hyperledger in the WC refable credentials is that uh, it's part of the standards, interoperable standards, uh, which is really good for adaption of the solution, uh, which is really good to be able uh, to use a solution with multiple vendors. Uh, for example, one party may implement the issuer, another party may implement verifier, third party may implement uh, the wallet, uh, and they can all work with each other since they support the same standards. So it's pretty important about the standards. Okay, thanks, Alexander. Uh, next question, can I use some non-creds to support SII on an application that uses Hyperledger and Polygon? Uh, yeah, so one of the goals of a uh, new CL Anoncrats uh, initiative to make it ledger agnostic. And uh, basically, yes, there is kind of an interface in Anoncrats interface of uh, this data registry, like with the methods like write, read, and so on. 
And there can be multiple implementations of this interface. Hyperledger Indy is one of the implementations. Checked Ledger is another. Uh, so basically, no one uh, prevents uh, to create implementation based on Polygon, right? So now with this uh, initiative, it should be quite straightforward to do it. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, there are any um, existing working implementations, at least of part of Hyperledger. Maybe somewhere in Polygon it is, but uh, yeah, basically, technically, I believe it can be supported. There is no reason why not. And that's one of the goals of uh, this data and credits initiative is to make it leisure agnostic. Okay. Uh, next question from YouTube. Uh, can you share a scenario where only DLT is the only option in comparison to centralized ledger? By centralized ledger, what is meant? Well, because usually, well, if you're talking about distributed ledgers, it's the centralized. Maybe, or maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's just a typo. Just type. Okay, uh, okay. May, 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 maybe, yeah, the question is about uh, advantages of kind of decentralized identity versus centralized identity, right? So uh, if so, uh, the advantage is that uh, the user controls the data, actually, because, for example, verifiable credentials, uh, they usually belong, they're usually stored in the mobile wallet or the users of the holder side. They are not stored on some third-party entity. And uh, uh, every relationship between the holder and verifier, it can be done directly in peer-to-peer -peer fashion which is better in terms of privacy preserving. The issuer part doesn't need to be involved. Like identity provider who issued the credentials, it doesn't need to be involved there, which is, uh, of course, uh, much better. Also, it allows, opens the way, for example, for passwordless authentication, uh, ways for uh, like delegation uh, and so on. So it's better in terms of privacy, in terms of security. It can provide a very nice uh, UX. Uh, yeah, that's probably the main thing. Okay. Uh, next question. What is the advantage of using a blockchain ledger to store the issuer's public key over the issuer maintaining a store for verification? As you said, a blockchain ledger is not necessary, necessary for SSI. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, basically, uh, one of the advantages of using uh, as a ledger since we are talking about decentralized identity, right? Uh, then it's good idea uh, to get rid of any points of centralization somewhere. Otherwise, the whole concept can be a bit broken. And uh, the distributed ledgers, uh, decentralized, it's one of the decentralized ways to establish trust, right? Because uh, the public key needs to be trusted. So of course it can be stored in some uh, central ledger, if there is a full trust to the central entity. But if there is no such trust, then the centralized ledger can be uh, a very good option. So for example, even, uh, let's consider this following example. For example, if uh, the issuer uh, will store its keys on its own company website, what will happen if this issuer company organization uh, is set down, is not available anymore, right? Uh, it will mean that all issued credentials uh, won't be working because uh, there will be no way to verify them. The public key, this website of the issuer won't be available. But uh, if you use the ledgers, the decentralized ledgers, it provides a much better guarantee that the service will be available. Uh, and as in any blockchain, even if a couple of nodes are uh, down or malicious, the whole service will still be functional. and. Uh, all the issued verifiable credentials can be used even if the issuer is unavailable or not in service anymore or just get out of business. So it's a very nice thing to really own the identity independent of uh, some centralized parties. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Uh, I guess that's it. We don't have any more questions. And if you 
if you still have some, please feel free to ask them. Well, anyway, if you have some follow-up questions, you can reach our company via social media. The links, all the links are in the chat or maybe by email uh, and whatever. Okay. Well, I guess that's it for today. Great. Well, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah, David, yeah, go ahead, please. I was just going to say thank you and thank you to Alexander as well. And thank you to everyone who joined. Uh, if, uh, as Anton was saying, if you have other questions, you know, again, please feel free to reach out. You know, hopefully this is the beginning of an ongoing discussion and we're looking forward to talking with you more. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, yeah, big thanks for, to all of you who joined us today. Definitely. Thank you. Well, yeah. See you next time. Online meetup, or maybe in person. Sounds good.